a lot for having me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what DIY medical technologies are at the Little Devices Lab and the other um, projects that we have going on. What you're looking at is about two and a half tons of well-intentioned goods delivered uh, at hospitals around the world. This one in particular is in Nicaragua. And this is a st how we started to make medical devices. We learned that 90% of them fail in developing countries. Uh, and the approach was basically the same approach we use with medical devices that we have here. A designer and an engineer and perhaps a doctor gets together and uh, comes up with a good idea, sends off the, 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 the machine to be manufactured thousands of miles away from whenever a patient is actually going to use them. In the case of the developing world, most of them actually fail. So our approach is really not to think that we can do it better. Uh, there's a lot of smart people working on the problem. Our approach is how do we empower the populations that actually use these types of devices to make them themselves? And that means that we have to take a page from what the maker movement and the DIY movement and all these surge of fabrication opportunities of everyday people making really fantastic devices and open it up to healthcare. Because so far, there have been two different worlds that they basically don't talk. And what we do every day in the little devices labs, how do we, how do we bridge those two fields so that they come together? And you know, as much as I'm a geek and I love computers and I love data, there, there are certain things where we just hit a wall and we have to empower our patients uh, in a different way. Um, we did a quick uh, screen capture of apps. I just literally Googled asthma apps, see what would happen. And there's lots of them out there. None of them can actually stop an asthma attack. Um, this is Marco on the left. About a, two years ago, Anna Young from the lab went over to, to Nicaragua and basically made some prototyping exercises. And one of the things that we have in the lab is a mechanism in which you can make, um, for about $10, a simple nebulizer. And not knowing that he would be married a year later, that he would have a three-month-old uh, with acute pneumonia, not knowing that he was not going to have money to buy an $80 nebulizer. A year later, Anna actually trained uh, Marco on how to make these things, partly because it's fun, partly because they would look at their luggage like, what is that? So they, we just, that's what we do. We take gadgets all over the world. And this is Marco on the right with his daughter when he was actually explaining to me what he actually pulled off. He, when, when the doctor told him, uh, this is what you need, and it needs to be four times a day, and one is at 3 a.m., and one is at 8 a.m., uh, he said, I can't afford that, but I can make it. And those are the types of things where when we think of patient empowerment, we very much think in the analog world. Because at the end of the day, we are analog. We did some fancy testing uh, in, uh, in, uh, at MIT, and w when you look at the, what, what this type of device does, it tracks basically the same PARI LC nebulizer uh, when you shine a laser through it. Um, so these are the types of things that we want people to think about. We, 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 we can count things, but it's so much better to, 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 to make things that hopefully can heal. There are some challenges to this. You know, we're fascinated by this notion when we think of technology. Uh, uh, Arthur C. Clarke had said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And when you look at healthcare devices, it is very true. It's basically designed for black box. You cannot break it open. You cannot understand how it works. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it remains a very, a very expensive mystery. So we do device teardowns, such as this one, where we took apart um, cauterizer pens and tried to understand why were they really $25. Uh, and, and when we looked with the material science department at MIT, we realized it's about $3 worth of materials. Uh, and we can argue the, the, the mechanisms of why there's such a high markup, but until we start to understand as consumers and patients um, the almost artificial complexity of certain devices. We won't have a very good argument to try to lower healthcare costs. There are social structures. You know, we always think of who's actually the person that comes up with the best ideas in the hospital. We always think of, of you know, the Dr. House aspect. So if we never think of the nurses, and this is one of the things that, that we've been noticing, not just around the world, but, it, but in the States. There's also who is the actual innovator. There, 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 I, I was yelling at my TV screen about, um, six months ago, when I realized that a TV show was portraying Syrian surgeons as um, amateur doctors when the Seattle yuppie doctors were the ones that actually were showing them how to do anesthesia with a milk carton. I was like, well, I think it's the other way around. Um, so we have these stereotypes that persist. Medical technology is not very good to long tails. If you are a patient that needs a very customized device, 
and you're, there's only five of you uh, in an area of the country, you're going to be trying to innovate how to finance it uh, because it's not a, 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 good, a good set of, um, of challenges for, for the marketplace. But we can solve this using DIY approaches. And finally, making stuff. There's this, this uh, preconceived notion that when we think of medical technology, you need a place like this. Now, let me give you some examples that show how some of the approaches that we started to, to, to observe and, and explore can counter this. This is a man in China who's been on dialysis for about seven years now. And last year, there was a story that showed that he actually had made his own dialysis machine because he couldn't afford it. He's now on government state-sponsored uh, uh, dialysis because the Chinese government was too uh, embarrassed uh, with, with the fact that he had to cobble up his own device to, 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 to do dialysis. Um, and when most of my students, when they first come into the lab, they, their immediate uh, notion is, you really shouldn't try this at home, um, especially something like this. But let me show you some other examples of other people that have tried this at home. Um, balloon angioplasty. This is the kitchen of Dr. Andreas Grunzig. He made the first balloon angioplasty prototypes uh, after 11 p.m. when he would come home from, from, from his hospital job in Switzerland and basically prototyped these devices on his kitchen counter with his neighbor until 4 a.m. in the morning. He went on to Emory University and created a whole new field that is now, uh, it, it, had it not been for that tinkering, it would have taken longer or somebody else would have had to do it, but this is, this is very real. Before him, uh, another a uh, doctor called Charles Dotter used very unconventional materials to, use, to, to invent some of the first uh, catheters that, 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 that then went on to become Cook Biomedical, a large medical device firm. And a lot of people know about the example of Earl Bakken, who basically had a garage uh, where he made the first wearable pacemaker. So this, we've seen DIY work before, uh, so, and, and I think we can see it work again. Um, there's an enormous amount of ingenuity, for instance, in the work of nurses around America, and they generally are not heard that well. And so we need to pay attention to what they're making, what they want to make, what our patients want to make, and give them the tools so that they can do it better. So when we first started to approach people like that, uh, both in the developing world and over here, we started to notice that there were two things that they always had in common. Number one, the prototypes did not look that great, but they worked. Number two, um, they were extremely embarrassed about their creativity. Um, this, is a, this is a nurse in Esteli, Nicaragua, who basically fixed her own stethoscope uh, because it, the diaphragm had broken, and she basically went around the hospital trying to experiment with different types of plastics to replace it and ended up using the overhead transparency slides um, of whatever grand rounds were being given that week. But it took us like two hours to cajole her into actually showing us their, her device. And I thought that was a tragedy, because had she been in Cambridge, we would have had her give her a talk at MIT. And, uh, <laughs> and so these are the types of innovators that we're after. And the way we do it is we basically create construction sets. Um, our, our lab focuses more on how do we design um, modular solution space than having uh, somebody else own the problem and have our engineers own the solution. We get a lot more excited when somebody calls us and says, we made this. So basically, the Medikit is a, a, a set of construction kits. And some of the things that you can uh, make in some of the approaches that use Medikit approaches are things like the solar clave, which is a solar-powered surgical sterilization device. And it comes as a kit, and you put it together in the, in the best way that you think you can put it. We can use um, microfluidics powered by Legos because Legos have, have amazing tolerances. We can use um, lateral flow assays, again, using very standard parts um, that people can, can mix and match. And so these are some examples of that. We have a platform that allows you to, we can test essentially in a non-invasive way <clears throat> whether somebody has taken their medication at a distance. Not just a reminder, not just a proxy uh, alert, but actually understand, did it go through your system in a, and, and, and test that in a non-invasive way. And then we can provide interesting data uh, to hack their behavior by giving them a reward. And we are interested in data. One of the things that, that, that we started to, to notice is that we, we, spoke, we speak to our colleagues in public health, they get fascinated about data sets. But one of the, 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 the moments that, to me, really struck uh, truth was when I asked somebody, what did you work on? And they said, I, I work in very, very large data sets, millions, and I study death as an outcome in pediatrics. And, and, and I basically, I didn't know what that means. And I said, what does that mean? Well, I look at what, what people die from. And I thought, okay, he just said 
babies. So in my naive way, I said, can, can we save some? And then I started to, to, to look at is that there's this whole industry, not industry, there's a whole field that basically counts our patients and understands what happened to them way after the fact. And then they start becoming patients, they become statistics, and yes, we run inter interesting algorithms on them, but when I talk to our doctors, they realize that they are still patients. Um, so we want to get away from this and look at how do we move from epidemiology that looks at situations in the way climate scientists look at situations and look at epidemiology that in, in real time in the way a weather uh, man would tell you what happened. And so we've done things like uh, real-time diagnostics for both environmental and infectious disease. And if you notice, people are putting them together in the field because we're more interested in people not just using the device but also customizing it and using the device that they wanted. And that's again why we work on construction sets. We work a lot of stuff on hardware. We have a lot of fun, but fundamentally, um, the main tenets is how do, we, how do we create these things so that they can be hacked even once long after we're gone? And our lab looks like any other lab. We have a lot of fun, but you know, everything from 3D printed nebulizers to uh, wearable devices to, to, to diagnostics. Um, but fundamentally, what, what I got excited about sharing with you at, at, at Medix is, is um, we, if we want to empower our patients, if we want people to have a more participatory process in, in medicine, let's remember the analog, uh, because at the end of the day, that's how we heal. Um, we have an interesting new project with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, they're supporting us uh, on an initiative to basically go find maker nurses. So any, uh, when you walk into the hospital again, uh, talk to them. Find out what they're hacking. Find out how they're making it. Find out what, what ideas they're, they're, they're trying to make or have made um, and tell them, tell them to talk to us. Thanks a lot.